Hey, good morning, everybody. Beautiful day outside. Awesome time in here this morning. We can't wait to worship together here for the next 45 minutes. Hello to everybody who's watching us on Facebook Live this morning and everybody who's joining us out in the parking lot in their automobiles. We're glad that you're here. We have a digital connection card that you can fill out if you want to let us know that you're here and if you would like to tell us about any prayer requests that you might have. If you're a guest here with us today, we honestly are super excited that you're here and we want you to come back and join us again. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about how you can make this your church home, your church family. And so uh, see one of us uh, after this morning is over and we can, uh, we can get on that conversation. We'd love to meet you face to face. Hey, let's stand up. I'm gonna pray for us. And then we're going to sing a few songs of worship to the Lord, get us ready for the word this morning. Father, we thank you for today. Um, we are coming to you today with a lot of heavy hearts, and some of us are, are having you know, coming off of a great week, but we're all coming from a different perspective. We've got to admit, Lord, that uh, this year everything is not normal, and things are quite weird. And so our, we're stressed out a little bit. Uh, at different times during the day, there's so much going on and, and family relationships are weird and, and work is weird and we just want worship to be a place where we come and we let you know all that and you already know that, but we're just letting our hearts open to you. And we're gonna say, God, you're bigger than all that. We just want this to be a place of renewal and refreshing and encouraging from your word. So would you please let your spirit do that for us today? Help us just to have a big sigh and let that go into some peace that you bring us this morning. Uh, we know you're, we're your children and that you love us. So we're asking for this gift this morning from our heavenly father, you, you would do that as we worship today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen.
We love you. Thank you, Lord. Change our lives. Turn our lives around.
your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so time to study the Bible together. All right. Father, as we uh, get ready to explore your word, and uh, you've laid some amazing things on my heart in the last 72 hours, I pray that uh, you guide us as we talk. 
and open up our minds, our hearts, and our ears. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, a week ago Friday, I gave Laura the sermon. Um, it's entitled, our, When Your Heart Caves In. And it was going to be about Zacchaeus. And then after some events of last week, about Wednesday night, God started uh, screaming at me. Thursday, it got worse. At about four o'clock, I show up for football practice and I called Don and I said, hey, don't show my PowerPoint. He goes, what? I said, we're not doing that sermon. So the people Thursday night got a very raw message. Hopefully you get the same thing today. Because what I'm tired of is hate. I am physically, emotionally sick of hate. Sick of it. I don't understand it. I don't get it. It blows my mind. And this morning, when I was doing a little reading before church started, God's like, you got to share this. This is out of Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 32 to 33. And by the way, you can't read it on the screen today. So if you got your Bibles, pull them out, or if you got your computer or on your phone, pull it out. Because we're going old school today, okay? Nothing's going to be behind me. Um, verse 32, Jesus is telling them in Mark chapter 8 that, hey, I'm going to die pretty soon. I'm, you know, I've got to do this sacrifice. And they're getting kind of mad at him. And listen to what Peter does. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. And Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples and then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. This is what happened to me Thursday. Thursday, God said, look at it through my eyes. When we read verse 33, we get stuck on get behind me, Satan. We stop before we read the rest of that. What did he tag on to just saying, hey, get behind me. Don't let Satan in your heart. Don't let Satan get into you. He then goes on to say, stop looking at things from the human point of view. There is something that has to stop in this nation, in this world. It's just one topic we're going to cover today that I am tired about hate. Racism has to be seen through God's eyes, not our eyes. Amen. It has to be. It's got nothing to do with what I look on the outside. Nothing. Nothing. I am so tired of hate. We judge people if they're taller than us. If they're shorter than us. Amen, Mark. Go there, baby. <laughs> now, the, and here it is. We judge them if they're smarter or if they have learning disabilities. I'm tired of the hate. I'm tired that we don't look at people through God's point of view, God's judgment, God's perspective, God's way. But that's not what we do. Kenny, it's the way I was raised. That's the biggest cop out I've ever, ever heard. Kenny? I've always been told her, they come from that side of the tracks. Stop! Stop! I've always been told her, they live up on the top of the hill. Now watch. I love this. Amy's uh, stepbrother, brother as we call him, Sean, just moved here from Florida, got a job in Akron. He's lived in Bradenton, Florida for 52 years. He moves here. He makes a statement to me the other day that I thought was so hilarious. He's working for a company that when there's weather's damage, he goes to their homes and, and does inspections. He goes, Kenny, there is some freaky looking roads in Ohio. I feel like I'm in a horror movie. There's moments I don't know if I wanna knock on the door. You guys all know what he's talking about, right? But isn't that what we do? 
But I said, Sean, some of the people on the other side of those doors are the nicest folks you ever want to meet. Nicest folks you ever want to meet. But what do we do? We judge because of how something looks or something acts. And God says, look through my eyes. Now that brings me to John chapter 4. Ben Black, John Vincent talked about this back on March 8th when we were doing a building project. I'm going to look at it with different eyes today. Let's start out in verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. I want you to remember that sentence when we get to like verse 32 and 33. A lot of people were being baptized because of Jesus' words. But did you catch what was thrown in parentheses in most of your Bibles? Jesus wasn't doing the baptizing. Jesus was planting the seeds. Disciples were reaping the harvest. Hey, church, Kenny Thomas don't have to do all the baptisms. Mark Black, Tanner, Kevin, Don, Brandon, we don't have to do all the baptisms. You can do them. We are all messengers of God. You all got people that you can share a message with. That's what he was teaching here. Anybody can do the baptizing as long as you believe in me and have a relationship with me and share the message. Now let's go on to verse 2 or verse 3. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. And evidentially, he came to the Samaritan village of Sachar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat early beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because these disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. We're going to stop there. She is surprised by two things. First is this. You guys never talk to us because we're biracial. Samaritan, Samaria was a part of Israel on the northern part. There was a region the Jewish people were taught not to go through because the people that lived there migrated there because they were Jewish and another nationality. They were biracial. Good, practicing, good people, Israelites, would not go through Samaria because of that reason. I imagine the disciples were questioning Jesus. Let's go around it. Why are we going through it? Because he's about to change the game. The other reason, she was a woman. There's a reason why John puts specifically that he was alone. Because if you were alone as a man, you did not talk to another woman that was alone. That was the practice of that culture. You didn't even act like they existed. That was the practice of that culture. Jesus is changing the game. He could care less what her nationality was. He could care less who she was. He only cared that she was made in the image of God and God gave her breath. So sitting at that well that day, he's about to teach to his disciples and more importantly, and I'm gonna word it this way, the modern day church who likes to talk about feel good messages, gonna teach them that you gotta go love people. People. He is changing the game. He's walking the other side of the tracks. He's taking the message to people that had never heard about the Messiah. And he's going to change it. Her reply. She said, the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you, And who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living 
water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this with living water? Now she is totally confused. Because number one, he's talking to her. He's giving her the time of day. And then he asks for a drink. And she goes, hey, we got an issue. You can't use my bucket. Secondly, you have nothing and this well is as deep as it can go. How are you going to get it? And he goes, only if you knew who you're talking to. I am the living water. The living water. In the church today, we say we know Jesus. Do we act like the living water? Or we have our own behaviors? If you've really tasted the living water, there would be no prejudice in you about anything. If you've really tasted the living water, you would be loving people for who they are. But here's what happens to us. Something in our past forms us more than the living water does. Culture teaches us something else the living water doesn't. And we start believing in the culture more than the living water. Jesus says, I'm going to give you something that's going to blow your mind. I am that living water, he's going to tell her in a little bit. Look here, and I love what she does. Her mind's got to be racing. And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestors, Jacob, who gave us this wealth? I love this. I don't know how heaven could be, but if Jacob is sitting in heaven and she hear, and he hears this statement, well, Jacob's greater than you, Jacob would probably go, what are you talking about? I am nowhere near him. She, do you know who Jacob is? Jacob was the father of Israel in a way, the 12 tribes, son of Joseph. He was a grandson to Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, Esau, you know the story. She says, you're not greater than him. That's what we love to do to Jesus. We love to put Jesus in a box and say, well, you're not greater than this. Oh, yeah, he is. Jacob doesn't hold a candle to Jesus. And your thoughts and your attitudes don't hold a candle to Jesus. You need to be thinking with Jesus' thoughts, with Jesus' attitudes, with Jesus' mindset. It goes on here. How can you offer better water than he, his sons, and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now, here's, here's what dawned on me the other day. Friday, I got to baptize a young man by the name of Travis Hall. On March 8th, most of you got to meet him if you went to the fellowship hall. Travis is the gentleman behind the architecture drawings of our new building. Travis is going to help lead us through this project. Travis comes into the church Tuesday morning and says, hey, I need to be baptized. I need to give my life to Jesus. Watch the video. You can see his eyes bubbling when he comes out of that water. Bubbling. I get a message Saturday morning at 4 a.m. that I did not read till about 7 when I woke up from a young lady by the name of Tiffany Clear, her husband's Doug. He goes, hey, I can't sleep. We want to be baptized. I went, okay, here we go. What happens to us, though? When we first give our lives to Jesus, we're bubbling. We got the living water oozing out of us. We can't wait to go tell everybody about Jesus. But what happens over the years and the decades? Here's what happens. We start to lose the bubble. We're not bubbly. We've lost it. Because we let our perceptions and what we think church is to make us act and make us who we are. And Jesus looks at us and goes, that's not what I want. I want you to be bubbly. I want you brimming. I want the water sparkling in your eyes. I want you drinking me. Me. And if the modern day church does that, we can erase racism. We can knock it out. Of 
and understand what they're going through and try to figure out how we can help them. Real conversations. Listen to what, she, what he says next, because he gets real. Go get your husband. Can you hear it turning? Can you hear, can you hear the fear? Oh my goodness, he wants behind the door. Until this point, she had on the Sunday morning church face. And now he got real. Now he's talking. Now he's ready to talk. Now he's going to walk through the door. We don't like that. We don't like it when somebody sits down with us and gets real. We don't like it when somebody comes into our homes and goes, hey, I want to talk to you about the hate in your heart. I want to ask you about the sin going on in your life. I want to see how I can help you. I want to listen, listen. Oh, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said to her, with no judgment in his eyes and no judgment in his voice, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands, and you haven't even married the man you're living with now. You've certainly spoken the truth. Did you hear what he did? He listened. And then he spoke the truth. He goes, you're right. You're right. You're living in sin. You know you are. We have to have real talks. Let me get on another soapbox because I deal with this. We have to teach young people that I understand we got all the things in the world why it's better to live together. But that's not what God wants. God wants you married. God wants you to stand before him and say it. And, and I get it. It's better financially. Strings aren't attached. If I get tired of them, I can move on. But that's not a relationship. A relationship means you're going to get down and get ugly with each other and get dirty. A relationship means I'm going to make a commitment to you. That's a relationship. And Jesus is looking with her to her and getting real, getting real, saying, you're right, you're right. And here's the other thing we need to do. I believe he listened a lot here. We're starting a new ministry up called Stephen Ministry. Mark has done a lot of training with a lot of people, and they're going to go into people's lives and try to help them. But here's the number one thing Stephen, Stephen Ministry has taught them. You don't speak, you listen. Now, for some of, that peop some of those people in that training, that's hard because they like to talk. But the first thing they've been taught is you listen. You don't speak, you listen. He's listening to her, to her. And she, and then she does something famous whenever we get real with each other. Listen to what she does in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Did you hear what she just did? What you and I do. She changed it real quick. Have you ever done that? I know I do it to Amy all the time. We don't want to talk about real things. So what do we do? We try to change the game real quick. She doesn't want to talk about what she's doing wrong. And Jesus is like, come on, talk to me. Listen to me. And she goes, you must be a prophet. So tell me why. It is that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here in Mount Kazim, where our ancestors worship. And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. For Samaritans know very little about the one who worship, who you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those, those who will worship that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship in him must worship in spirit and truth. So she changes the game on Jesus. And then she asked Jesus, why do you guys worship in Jerusalem? Why do we worship on this mountain? We're basically worshiping the same God. And then he says to her, but for now, salvation comes through the Jewish people. And then he introduces something new. 
but the time is now, now, that God is looking for true worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. So here's my issue. And this is where Don says I need to break the table, but I won't. If we're supposed to be the true worshipers, then why do we have so much hate in our lives? Don't sit here and tell me you don't struggle with hate. Don't sit here and tell me that you don't struggle with some things I've been talking about today. Don't sit here and tell me, because I struggle with the same things. Don't sit here and tell me that you don't struggle with what Jesus is talking about. And if we're true worshipers of him, then we need to get over that. There should be no hate in us. There should be no prejudice in us. There should be no us thinking we're better than somebody else in us. None. None. And then the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, and hell shook. Satan cringed because these words happen next. I am the Messiah. Demons fleed. Because he says it publicly, he says it out loud, they heard it. I am the one you've been waiting for. The game changer, the hate destroyer was standing in front of her, standing in front of her. I am the Messiah. And if you and I have accepted him, then we need to let the living water bubble outside of us. And we need to let people feel it and let people see it. And then I love this, just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to her? Oh my goodness, is that the modern day church? None of them had the nerve to go ask Jesus what he was doing. Were they thinking he wanted a date? I don't know. What were they thinking? They walked up, saw him talking to a woman, and they freaked out. And they didn't have the nerve to go up to him and say, what are you doing? They were like us. We love to talk behind leaders' backs. Well, I'm sure many of you, when you hang out together, well, why are they doing that at the church? Why does Kenny keep talking about this racism thing? Why are they doing that? Why do they put that post on Facebook? Why do they keep telling us to reach out to sinners? Well, I don't know. Maybe that's what Jesus says. I'm going to tell you a little trick. Tell you something I learned from Eric Kreitz, and I do it to this day. If you write me a letter or send me, well, emails, you can't get by if you send an email or Facebook. But if you send me a letter and you have not signed that letter, do you know what happens to it? I shoot a basket. I watched Eric Kreitz about three times a week bowl up a letter and throw it in the wastebasket. Here's the other thing that drives me nuts. I'm just going to tell you how I feel. When you come to me and say, so-and-so's not like what you're doing, but I can't tell you who who said it, then I don't want to hear it. Just leave. If they can't come talk to me, then we have an issue. We have an issue. I had that I love coaching Little League sports because I get that all the time. Well, hey, this parent doesn't like what you're doing. Well, well, parent, well, I can't tell you. Well, we're done with this conversation. If they can't come and tell me, then we have an issue. We have an issue. And that's what's happening here. But Jesus knows what they're doing, man. So listen to this. This is awesome. The woman left her water jar beside the well, ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. The disciples, meanwhile, disciples were urging Jesus to eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. And then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and finishing his work. You know the saying, Four months between planting and the harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. These fields are already ripe for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. 
and the fruit, the harvester, is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants, another harvests, and it's true. And I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Three amazing things jump out of what we just read. Number one, she ran back to town. Her life has changed. She's going to go tell people. Number two, Jesus looks at them and says this. I'm on a spiritual high. I don't need man's food. There is moments I can't eat, not because I'm worried about things, but Jesus has me so jacked up. There's days I don't eat. There's days I don't need water because I've got the living water running through my system. That's what he was doing. Third thing that jumped out of this. Do you understand that this is the best time to harvest? I can't explain it. But when we are freaking out in this world about what's going on, this is when God does his greatest work. Do you understand since March 17th, and I've said it before, but the numbers keep rising. After Wednesday night, we would have 22 baptisms in this church then March 17th. Don't tell me people aren't coming to God right now. Don't tell me. They're coming to God as much as I've ever, ever seen it before. Do you know in the last week we've had 10 people join this church, bring their membership to this church? Don't tell me that God doesn't do his best work when you and I are going crazy. That's when he does his best work. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of the woman. He told me everything I ever did, and when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because of what we've heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world, of the world. I stand up here because I've been blessed with seven kids in my life. And I've been blessed with six of them that look a little bit different than everybody else. And in the last three months, we've had real conversations. Hard conversations. Things I never knew that they went through. Things that I put my head in the sand and buried my head. I asked him, hard talks. I wanted to know how they felt when certain situations arised. Have you had those talks with your kids? Have you had those talks with your spouses? Have you had those hard talks? Have you had a hard talk with a coworker? Have you had it? I'm so tired of the hate. I've got Celia Hartman stuck on a new song, and she's actually put it on our Facebook logo. The song's entitled Revolutionary by Josh Wilson. I want you to listen to four lines out of the song. Let's take some time, open our eyes, look and listen. We're going to find we're more alike than we are different. And these two lines blow me away. Why does kindness seem revolutionary? When did... We let hate become so ordinary. Did you hear that? When did kindness become revolutionary? And when did hate become so ordinary? We as the church today at FCCM in Melbourne, Ohio, that reach out to communities all around us, we need to be example that kindness is ordinary and hate has been blown up. We're going to do something here in a moment after I give a little invitation. But I'm going to ask that if you need to come talk to us, Facebook me at four in the morning like Tiffany did. I don't care. Find one of the ministers and elder after church. We love to talk to you about giving your life to Jesus, to believe, to repent, to confess, to be baptized, forgiveness of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, can I have a real conversation with you this morning as we get ready to do communion? I'm not going to do a little devotion thing as we do this. 
But what hate do you got in your heart today? What hate? What hate? Is there a hate that you need to get out of your system? It might be a hate because of racism. It might be a hate because somebody has made a decision in their life to live a different lifestyle. It might be, you might have an ex that you hate. Well, figure out a way to get over that hate. You might have a neighbor that you just can't talk to. I don't know what your hate is, but can you bring it to the one who died on the cross for you today? We're gonna get quiet today. You're gonna have about two minutes since the preacher went long today. And I'm just gonna ask you in that two minutes to let the hate go and to partake of the bread and the cup that represents him. Let's partake. Oh, oh, oh. 
prayer that Christ would be exalted in our lives and in everything we do and say, hey, thank you for being a part of worship today. God bless you. If you want to give your offering, there's boxes at the doors on your way out. Hey, have a great day and a great week. We'll see you later.